In 2001, the complete human genome was sequenced for the first time in history. And since that time, it was discovered that humans have around 40,000 genes, a small fraction of which show signs of recent positive selection. This is relevant because the prevailing belief in the West is that our species has undergone very little evolutionary change in the last few centuries. And this is particularly the case when considering our cognitive models. The mental adaptations we do possess were thought to be products of genes resistant to change, as proposed by Cosmides and Toby in 1987. But there is some evidence that contradict this point, or at least argue for a more diverse perspective. Roughly 5% of genes in the human genome have undergone recent positive selection, which becomes more understandable when we consider the significant changes in selection pressures that our species has faced. In the last 100,000 years, humans have spread from East Africa across the globe, endured an ice age, embraced agriculture, and witnessed rapid increases in population densities. These diverse challenges likely played a role in driving recent positive selection on various genes, contradicting the viewpoint that our mental adaptations are solely the result of natural selection. Especially when we consider that most of these challenges, with the exception of the Ice Age, we ourselves have been responsible for creating. In other words, human activities have altered selection pressures by venturing into new environments with different climates, implementing agricultural practices, and domesticating animals. These activities fall under the concept of niche construction, which involves organisms modifying their environments and, as I'm going to argue, directly leads to changes in the human genome. Take agriculture as an example. It wasn't something independently invented by each farmer, and its presence isn't an innate outcome of human gene expression. Instead, it is a learned behavior that was passed down culturally. Cultural selection is the key factor that allows us as humans to influence our evolution, even in situations beyond human control, say for example the new climates humans eventually ventured into, which, through human innovation, would have significantly influenced the direction of selection. A great example could be the colder climates influencing us to focus on actions like creating clothing or controlling fire, which would then allow humans to live there, even without the necessary adaptations. It is situations like this that provide evidence for human cultural niche construction, playing a role in co-directing recent human evolution. Niche construction is a process where organisms alter their own and or others' environments through their activities and choices. This phenomenon is not exclusive to humans. Various animals build nests, dams, and burrows, while plants influence atmospheric gases and nutrient cycles. Fungi and bacteria decompose organic matter, and some have even been known to hijack hosts and move them into favorable conditions. The key aspect of niche construction is not just that an organism can influence its environment, but instead that the alteration of its environment also changes the organism, creating a new selection pressure. As a result, niche construction examples include activities like habitat selection and the influence of this habitat selection on the organism. Supporters of this theory try to shine light on the dynamic between reciprocal interactions of natural selection and niche construction, where evolution is portrayed as an intricate feedback cycle. In these networks, organisms previously shaped by natural selection instigate environmental changes, and these altered environments, in turn, influence the selection of changes in organisms. Traditionally, adaptation is seen as organisms fitting into existing environmental structures shaped by natural selection meaning the relationship between an organism and its environment is unidirectional. Environments serve as a source of selection and dictate the characteristics of living organisms. This viewpoint is a deep-seated assumption, and one key aspect of this perspective, advocated by Ernst Meyer, involves making a distinction between proximate and ultimate causes. Meyer argued that we shouldn't view an animal changing its environment as something separate from driving evolutionary changes. Instead, he insisted that their characteristics, like their ability to control fire, let's say, can be fully explained by the impact of prior natural selection. From this viewpoint, if our own devices do play a role in evolution, they are seen as a direct outcome of the main driving force, natural selection, because natural selection had to come first. Meaning, Meyer proposed that the features and behaviors observed in an organism's development, such as our own influence on our environment, are shaped and constrained by the outcomes of natural selection acting on previous generations. This is widely embraced. 
and also serves as evidence that niche construction cannot be the sole evolutionary process that shapes organisms. According to this viewpoint, niche construction lacks evolutionary significance in itself because any consequence it holds is fully preceded by a prior cause, namely, the natural selection that had to have taken place before it. But this idea, while accepted, has received significant pushback, mainly because it insinuates that all niche construction is genetically controlled. The human example of lactose absorption highlights this perfectly. Different humans have varying abilities to consume dairy products. This is due to physiological differences in the lactase enzyme, a characteristic linked to genetic variation. A correlation exists globally between the presence of genes associated with lactose absorption and a history of dairy farming. This correlation has led to the hypothesis that dairy farming created the selection pressures that made lactose absorption genes prevalent. It's speculation, but there is evidence that supports this idea, indicating that dairy farming predates the widespread presence of lactose absorption genes, not the other way around. So dairy farming serves as an example of human cultural niche construction, where cultural processes led to the selection and creation of new genes. Despite dairy farming not being driven by genes or natural selection, it undeniably carries evolutionary consequences, and other similar examples exist. The niche construction perspective deviates from the conventional view by suggesting that there are two primary selection pressures in evolution, natural selection and niche construction. Along with that, there are two broad forms of inheritance, genetic inheritance and ecological inheritance. Genetic inheritance involves passing on genes from one generation to the next, and ecological inheritance involves the transmission of modified environments from one generation to the next. So typically, descendant organisms inherit physically transformed environments through their ancestors, accomplished through both biological and non-biological fronts. Mathematical models to study the niche constructionist perspective have been developed, similar to algorithms studying, say, the selection of altruism. And the models showed, through their niche construction, organisms actively shape their local environments, influencing the pattern and intensity of selection within their own populations. Because of these models, some researchers believe the choices and modifications made by organisms in shaping their own environment have a more significant impact on evolution than other sources of selection, mainly because these self-directed changes create new paths for evolution and can lead to the establishment of specific gene variations that might otherwise be considered unfavorable. Even when organisms make small changes to their environment, it can have a big impact on how ecological systems and evolution work. This is because characteristics that are influenced by change can co-evolve with traits that cause those changes. This creates unique patterns in evolution when compared to traits evolving in isolation. Other studies like Silver and DePaolo's work from 2006 expand on this idea. They emphasize that traits related to niche construction can become dominant by favoring the selection of specific gene variations in other traits. This creates a connection between the traits related to niche construction and the traits they influence. For example, the Galapagos woodpecker finch illustrates this concept perfectly. These birds, by learning to use cactus spine for pecking insects under bark, create a woodpecker-like niche. This behavior establishes selection pressures that favor a bill capable of manipulating tools. In contrast to the sharp pointed bill and long tongue characteristic of most woodpeckers. Although the information acquired by individuals is not inherited as it is lost upon their death, processes like learning can still be crucial to the following generations. This is because learned knowledge can guide niche construction in ways that modify natural selection. This theory is significantly improved when we apply it to social learning, enabling animals to learn from one another. Numerous species of mammals, birds, and fish have been identified as capable of social learning. And because of sociality, newly acquired learned behaviors can rapidly permeate through populations, exposing individuals to new selection pressures. So why does this matter? The mathematical simulations I talked about earlier clearly showed that cultural niche construction, which involves modifying the environment based on cultural ideas, has a powerful impact on ecosystems. This influence can result in evolutionary consequences for species that share these environments. This is particularly the case in human evolution, where there seems to be a unique relationship between our cultural abilities and our activities in constructing our own niche. 
The feedback loop works like this. Over generations, cultural niche construction shapes environments, fostering an increased cultural presence, which leads to the growth and influence of cultural niche construction. Silver and DePaulo in 2006 suggest that niche construction can be self-reinforcing, with traits related to niche construction becoming dominant. This is especially relevant to human evolution, as the abilities for niche construction and cultural practices could have mutually intensified over time, resembling a dynamic similar to Fisherian runway sexual selection. The interaction between human niche construction and genetic selection is best explained through the relationship between antibiotic treatment and antibiotic-resistant bacterial strains. Body and Feldman in 2005 demonstrated that the cultural transmission of antibiotic use favors the selection of resistant bacterial strains, leading to cultural selection for avoiding antibiotic use. This behavior can result in maintaining strain differences even in regions where it would not be expected. The evolution of either host activity or parasite strain can be seen as a niche constructive activity, each modifying the environment of the other, fostering an arms race between cultural and genetic information transmission. Human evolutionary history involves adjusting environments through our own regulation, specifically to make survival easier. As an example, the ability of our human ancestors to control temperature through activities like manufacturing clothes and building shelters reduced selection for anatomical changes in response to these temperature extremes. This allowed humans to inhabit colder regions of the world, similar to how termites construct nests to regulate air temperature. But the thing is, this can still impact how our genetic makeup is directed. When human activities alter selection pressures, two potential responses ensue, genetic evolution or further niche construction. A great example of how cultural niche construction triggered a genetic response in humans is evident in the West African population of yam cultivators, who created clearings and forests for crop cultivation, leading to various consequences. The clearings increased standing water, creating mosquito breeding grounds and elevating the presence of malaria. This altered selection pressure, favoring an increase in the frequency of the hemoglobin S allele, which in its heterozygous state provides protection against malaria, created the conditions necessary for this trait to become prevalent in the yam cultivators. So while genetic evolution is commonly perceived as a slow process, significant genetic changes can occur in humans over a few hundred years, particularly in response to niche constructionist activities. This outcome is much different from examples of manufacturing clothes and building shelters. Here, evolutionary change is directed rather than prevented. Our activities actively led to evolution directing our genetic makeup in a new direction. The second pathway through which humans may adapt to prior niche construction is by engaging in further niche construction. Consider the example of environmental pollution. While populations exposed to pollution may initially experience adaptive lag during the development and adoption of new technologies, human beings have a remarkable capacity for innovation and building upon previous technology. These traits make us highly effective niche constructors. In instances where humans pollute their environment, soon after, solutions may emerge through the invention of new technologies designed to eliminate this problem, which makes a case for itself. Genetic evolution is not the only mechanism for adapting to environmental changes. And this is suggested by the ability of humans to generate adaptive cultural responses to environmental changes resulting from prior niche construction. Contrary to the idea that our genes take a long time to catch up with changes in our environment, studies of the human genome show strong evidence that there has been recent selection acting on genes linked to how our brain works. But keep in mind, this is only 5% which is much smaller than the genes that would have resulted from processes such as natural selection. Even so, small genetic changes can have big impacts, and the dynamic relationship between us and our surroundings is a selection pressure that today might have just as much if not more impact than something like natural selection. But hey, that's just the theory. Until next time, cheers.